Welcome to another Vegan Primary Care live session. This is Dr. Scott Harrington coming to you live from my doctor's office at veganprimarycare.com, where you can see a vegan doctor as your primary care doctor from the comfort of your own home from most U.S. states. If you happen to live in Florida, then I'm also open for in-person visits Friday in Pinellas Park, Florida, just north of St. Petersburg. Come see me, not just as a one-time consultation, but as your primary care doctor, someone who gets to know you and someone who can be your health advocate. Because I'm licensed in most U.S. states, even if you move, you don't have to change doctors. If you're a vegan, then get a doctor who gets you. If you haven't adopted a plant-based diet yet, you are still welcome to be my patient. But beware, a healthy vegan diet, exercise, and lifestyle changes will always be my first recommendation. My goal is to help you take control of your health. And through the power of a healthy lifestyle, we will work to heal your chronic conditions with the ultimate goal of helping you come off your medications. For my patients who cut out animal products altogether, you will not only be helping yourself feel better, but you will also do your part to stop animal suffering and to decrease your impact on the environment. Remember that this content is for educational and entertainment purposes only. This video is not intended to take place of your own doctor's advice. Okay, we are streaming live on multiple platforms, including YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Twitch, ready to take your questions. Okay, let me pull up the comments section here. We've got... Hi, from Tamara Sergi, from me and mom. All right. Good, here. I feel like, uh, feel like uh, you know, okay, my phone, it's on. I've got it on mute. Okay, and we've got Rena. Okay, Rena says, should we take our vitamin D supplement with D3 containing K2 as well or just D3? Well, I, I I don't see why you have to take uh, any additional K2. As long as you're getting greens in your diet, uh, greens contain plenty of, of K2 and you're going to get enough equivalent to a supplement. Uh, and so this, uh, I believe there's an absorption concern with K2 and making sure that the vitamin D works. But if you're vegan and you hate eating greens, you need to reevaluate. You got to start eating more greens in your diet. Uh, the goal every day, try to have a salad every day. And then if uh, with, with the vitamin D, I don't think it would hurt to have vitamin D with K2. Uh, but uh, uh, you can get the good old standard vitamin D. I, I recommend taking 2,000 units of vitamin D. Uh, but if you don't get, if you barely ever get sun, maybe take more like 5,000 units. Uh, it, and um, and we've talked about this in previous videos and, and that sort of thing. So you get plenty of vitamin K2 with greens. So it's not a complete requirement. Okay, thanks, Rena. Now, Karen Bliss. Good day, Dr. Harrington. Is coconut water the same as fruit juice in terms of sugar content, or is it okay to drink regularly? Good question, Karen. Hey, Coconut water is pretty low in sugar, and it is, uh, I love it. I love coconut water. It doesn't have any fat. You know, a lot of times we worry about with coconut, we worry about fat. And with the coconut water, there's, there's, it's negligible amount of fat. And so I, I, I drink it frequently um, in case, you know, you get bored drinking regular water sometimes. Now there is a little bit, of, there's some calories. I think it's might be, you know, 40 to 50 calories per serving. So uh, uh, you have to kind of be careful, uh, but it's it's going to be less than juice. It's going to be less than juice. I Maybe I should, I should double check that. Cocoa, here we go. Coconut water, water, nutrition facts. All right, 45 calories for eight fluid ounces, but it's got 470 milligrams of potassium, 11 grams of carbs, which of the, which 10 of those are sugars. So, but uh, uh, no, I love, I love coconut water and I drink it all the time. All right. 
Okay, thanks, Karen. Okay. So Rena's saying, hey, most options for Amazon include vitamin K, uh, and that's why I wasn't sure. So yeah, it, I, I don't think that the vitamin K is going to be problematic for you. Uh, if you get a, a, a vitamin D supplement with D with or without vitamin K. So, uh, but vitamin K is very prevalent in greens and then you should, you shouldn't have to worry about it necessarily. Uh, maybe this is for the, the group of folks who are taking the vitamin D and, but never actually eating very many greens in their diet. Uh, and so that they are low in vitamin K. All right. Karen, all right. Yes, get get the coconut water with no extra added sugar, definitely. All right, okay. So, where is this? I, I uh, wanted to, in Dr. Furman's book, Eat to Live, I was looking the other day and it had a cool uh, quote, cool quote that I wanted to put out. Oh, of course, I'm not gonna be able to find it now. Ah. The best prescription is knowledge. The best prescription is knowledge by Dr. C. Everett Koop. Yes, yes, yes. The knowledge, knowledge of a plant-based diet, knowledge of nutrition, and, uh, and, and learning about how to heal yourself through nutrition. That is the best prescription. Ideally, we could avoid medications. I'm not opposed to prescribing medications to people if, if they need them and they've tried dietary, dietary cure. And uh, and they still are have are still struggling with a medical problem. And then you know we have these tools, but as opposed to using them as a first line and having the associated side effects, you want to try to do a dietary or lifestyle cure first. Uh, always always first line intervention. So, okay, what questions do we have? Go ahead and likes and throw in the questions. We've got folks from. We've got folks from Facebook. We've got folks from YouTube right now. Okay. All right. Let's pull up some. We can pull up some slides. I have an announcement. I have an announcement. I am going to be at a St. Pete Veg Fest on Saturday, and then I'm going to be on an Ocala Veg Fest on Sunday. So if you guys are interested in rendezvousing, seeing me here in uh, St. Pete on Saturday or in Ocala, Florida on Sunday, I will be there uh, giving lectures and answering questions. I'll have a booth. And so um, come out, come out and uh, see me and, uh, and let me know how you're doing and, and I can, uh, we can talk more. Okay, we have Vita Liberata. Do you recommend eating Brazil nuts for selenium? Yes, yes. So at least one Brazil nut a week is probably do it. Uh, maybe two a week if you really want to be doubly sure that you're getting enough selenium. But uh, selenium is one of the nutrients that you'll find when you do your uh, food logging app. You'll find what I find is I tend to, uh, if I'm really not paying attention, I'll be about 400 milligrams down on calcium. And I'll be, let's see, I think I've, I wrote this down recently this morning. Uh, uh, about 400 milligrams down on calcium uh, under the RDA. And I'll be about uh, 100 milligrams deficit on magnesium, 10 on zinc, and about 30 micrograms on on selenium, if I'm not, you know, being careful and adding very specific uh, foods to my diet. So I always recommend to folks to kind of get on one of those food logging apps like Chronometer, because then you can kind of see where, where you're uh, where you're deficient. So uh, a lot of times, simply eating a big large salad throughout the day it will will kind of bump you up on most of your nutrient uh, profiles. But some of those weird ones like zinc and selenium. Sometimes supplementation might be reasonable if you if you're not finding them from your food, and um, and so I guess I used to, you know I used to be like 
hey, never supplement unless you know you absolutely have to. But uh, in this case, it's probably reasonable uh, if you if you if you check it out and you realize that you're always deficient to get sort of a, a small supplement just bumping you up uh, in those areas. All right. We've got Jennifer and from hi from North Florida. Hello. All right. Thanks for being on today. Okay, so I've got a plethora of different things that uh, that we could talk about today. All right. All right, so let's see what are some of the things we're going to talk about today. Erica Appleseed says, yes, a Brazil nut. Dr. Greger promotes eating four on the fourth of every month. Okay, I think what he's suggesting is that, yeah, you can get them all at once uh, and that eating more than this would go over the recommended dose. So why eat more than four? So I recommend one a week. Uh, so very, very similar, very similar recommendation. Okay, let's see. What could we talk about? Uh, all right. So some of the things that I go over with my patients on Tuesday night are the, we call them the icebreakers or the mixers. And we have each person talk about uh, various things that uh, they went over through the last week on their plant-based journey. And the icebreakers, so my icebreaker this last Tuesday was, what is your goal for next week? What is your process goal? So there's outcome goals and process goals. So outcome goals might be like, I want to lose two pounds this week. But the process goals is like, how are you going to do that? Are you going to eat a salad every day for lunch? Are you going to avoid eating pastries and junk food? Are you going to walk 30 minutes at a brisk pace three times this week? Uh, these are more of the process goals. These are the goals that lead to the effect or to the outcome. Because if you just kind of focus on the outcome, you can get uh, depressed if you, you know if you didn't get it, if you didn't meet your goals. So that was one of the things we discussed here in our in our meeting this week were process goals. If you have a, a process goal that you are interested in doing for this next week, put it in the chat. Put it in the chat about what you are going to do to try to improve your health this week on your plant-based journey. And we can talk about it. Okay. Let's see. So let's... Let's go over some other tips. Let's see, I'll try to share my screen. All right, let's try to do it. Press shift. News layout, shift and five. Hmm. Let's see if I can get it to work. Huh, I can't seem to get it to work. All right. Well, I guess I won't be doing that. Oh, here we go. Share. Share. Slide. Share my screen. Share slides. Let's try this. All right. Share screen. I'm going to pull it up. All right, pulling it up. Thanks for being so patient, you guys. Okay. This is kind of a busy... Ooh, that's not what I want. How about this? Okay, that's better. All right, so what is the whole food plant-based diet? What is it composed of? Uh when you the goals for the whole food plant-based diet in general are to get your food ratios your macro ratios about 80 percent carbs 10 percent protein and 10 percent fat a mix of raw and cooked vegetables all right i want you to keep your saturated fats to a minimum a minimum try to avoid these altogether, less than 10 grams 
we want to try to have as much fiber as possible. So 25 grams at least and uh, 47 grams, ideally, we want to get up to that number. If you're eating processed foods, which I recommend you don't do, try to keep it 90% whole. Uh, if you're eating some processed foods, okay, 10% or less, but ideally with the goal of none of those. But if you are, you can look at the package such as like bread and things like this, check to see if there is a five to one carb to fiber ratio. This is a way, you know, 20 carbs to four grams of fiber, at least something like that. And this potassium to sodium ratio. So potassium to sodium ratio will, can relate to blood pressure. The more potassium you have and the lower the sodium, then the lower the blood pressure. The more sodium and the lower the potassium, the higher the blood pressure. So those are some things that you can think about, some little goals uh, that you can shoot for uh, with that. Okay. So we've got a couple of things here. So Melissa Derby says, I, uh, today is the start of Lent, so my goal is no processed food. Uh, your abstinence list for the next 40 days, impressive, impressive. All right, good stuff. Yeah, this is a great time for uh, thinking about kind of bringing it back and pulling in and, and doing the right thing and being healthy. I love it. So that is a great goal, Melissa. Okay, Rena says, less coffee, more water. Okay, oh my gosh, I have taken upon myself to kind of wean myself off of caffeine and it has been painful initially. Woo, uh, December 23rd was my last day of, of drinking coffee uh, since 2021. And yeah, I've got, I had horrible headaches for several days. And then I just didn't like having this drug controlling me. So um, I imagine at some point there'll be some caffeine in my diet, but my regular dietary use of caffeine is is over with, hopefully. So uh, yes, this is like overstimulating your cortisol all the time and, and uh, the stress hormones uh, play a part in blood pressure. So uh, this is just sort of one of the legs of blood pressure. Blood pressure comes in many forms. So one through viscosity of the blood, two through having your tank full. So if you have too much salt in your, in your, your body, your, where salt goes, water goes, it's harder for your kidneys to remove the fluid. And so you retain fluid and you retain more water in the tank, higher blood pressure. And the last leg is the contraction of the blood vessels, which is mediated by stress. And so Coffee is a, is a little bit of a stressor. So uh, that is one of the reasons why I wanted to get it out of my diet. I'm not getting any younger. Not getting any younger. I can't be getting all stressed. So coffee had to go. All right. All right. Karen Bless says, my goal is to add more raw vegetables to my meals. I love it. Raw, raw tends to be better. Yes, you, you, know, you, hear, you hear talk about you know, you can get more nutrients out of tomatoes and lycopene if you cook it and stuff like that. But in general, raw food seems to be the way to go. You, uh, you tend to be more satiated, so it tends to be more filling. There's a lot more chewing involved, and it's not pre-cooked, pre-digested, and uh, you tend to be more satisfied. So make sure, add more raw vegetables and raw fruit to your diet. You will feel better for sure, Karen. Okay, Adrian Corcoran says, for a healthy individual, how many days of water fasting is considered safe? All right, so this is a great question. And there are water fasting centers because in general, water fasting is recommended under medical supervision, especially if you go three days or longer. Three days or longer is really uh, probably, three days is probably the limit that you would want to do uh, just at home. Now, you would not want to fast if you are a type 1 diabetic and you're taking insulin and stuff like this. Require insulin uh, without supervision, without, without supervision. So if you are totally healthy, you have no medical problems, make sure you're drinking plenty of water and you can, you can fast. You can fast and uh, 
honestly, the first day or the first day is the worst because your body is kind of used to the rhythm of your uh, of eating, and so the the first couple meals that you skip are are usually the hardest. And believe it or not, it kind of gets it kind of gets easier. And so when I've been on, on, on water fasts, you know, I'll have my cool water, I'll have my warm water. <laughs> it's just, it's kind of funny, but yeah, you can uh, you can uh, you can try to uh, kind of mix it up a little bit between your cold and warm water. But you wouldn't believe the benefits that you have, especially with prolonged fast and medical fasts. So you hear stories about people temporarily curing their diabetes or you know losing rapid amounts of weight and uh, seeing their blood sugars come way down. Um, rheumatoid problems improving dramatically, asthma, dramatic cures. Uh, and so water fasting is kind of always one of those treatments that is out there that, uh, and I do, I, I recommend anybody who wants to go to one of those places like True North uh, and there's many other uh, water fasting establishments that are medically uh, supervised to, if they have, can can do it, then do it because they will be impressed. One of the things that water fasting does, even if you're just doing it for a couple of days, is it can help reset your um, the bastardized taste buds, the taste buds that are used to the modern high uh, salt and sugar and the highly processed tastes. Um, one of the, uh, the slides I have here in my uh, in my uh, in my group here is this idea that uh, over here on one side of the screen, you have very colorful looking fruit. And then on one side, it's kind of dull. And so the concept here is that as we have uh, get used to the high salty food, fast food, this kind of thing, it makes us appreciate the natural flavors less. And, you know, compared to candy, uh, a strawberry might taste very, not taste very sweet. But uh, if you've gone on a fast, it really improves your hunger and improves the, the taste, believe it or not, of these foods dramatically. So, uh, yes, water fasting is a very powerful tool. But if you're doing it by yourself, don't do it any more than three days. Um, okay. Okay, here we go. Lent and lentils, mere coincidence? I think not. That's what Jonathan GI says. Oh my gosh, lentils. Can you can lentils? I mean, can we can we <laughs> can I hear it for lentils? I mean, lentils are amazing. They're a great sort of meat alternative. They taste, they're very kind of meaty flavor. You can make a lentil loaf, kind of like a meat loaf. You can make a shepherd's pie and use it for the ground beef portion. Oh my gosh. They even have these like black pearl lentils. They kind of burst in your mouth. They There's green lentils and orange lentils. You can make a dal, uh, a lentil soup, add it to other foods. Make some that are sort of al dente and put it in salads, a little vinaigrette uh, with it, and it's just, it's amazing. Yes. Lentils for Lent. I love it. <laughs> good one. Good one. All right. Well, if uh, let's, let's do this, this slide here. This is an analogy for salty food being a drug-like um, scenario with your mouth. I know when I eat Pringles, for instance, or Doritos, you know, back in the past when I, you know, there'd be Doritos in my house, one would go in my mouth and I'd be chewing it up and the next one would go in my mouth before I could even think twice. And uh, I was in a frenzy. I was in a feeding frenzy. And so I say, careful when you're eating a salty food, you're on fire. You're in a feeding frenzy. And what do you do when you're on fire? You have to stop, drop, and roll. Stop eating the Doritos or Pringles, drop them, and roll out and reflect on what happened. Oh my gosh, I was just in a feeding frenzy because of the salt. Uh, 
So whenever you're eating a really hyper palatable food, you'll realize that you're kind of stuffing your face on accident. And uh, this totally happens to everybody where nobody's immune to the power of the salt because that's uh, it's a flavor enhancer. So uh, just be careful. Be careful. Definitely. OK. We've got a few more minutes to go. If you're still here with us, go ahead and smash the likes. Smash the likes if you like what you're hearing. And drop a question in the field and uh, in, in the comment section and I'll see if I can if I can help you out. All right. Okay. Here's a fun little tip. All right. So what this is is a picture of wine tasting. Do I recommend wine? No, I don't recommend wine or any alcohol. Alcohol is the devil's sauce in general. But what this sort of highlights is the idea of the wine tasting. When people do wine tasting, they start with the sort of maybe uh, less powerful flavors like sparkling wine and then white and rosé, and it kind of goes into more powerful flavors. Um, I'd always heard to try dry wines before you try your sweet wines, because if you tried the sweet wines first, the dry wines would taste like vinegar. Blech, you know, they taste bad. So, so the concept is, is that this can also play a role in when you're eating food, when you're eating food to sort of maintain, you know, how tasty something is, is you want to eat the foods that have the, the uh, more subtle flavor palettes earlier in the meal or first. So things like salads or, you know, you know, things like mild fruit or something like that for dinner. If you eat them in courses, especially with kids, if kids, if you give kids the pasta with marinara, a real strong marinara flavor first, they're not going to eat the vegetables on the side because the vegetables in comparison would taste pretty nasty. So what you would do is you would give them maybe the cooked vegetables first or the raw salad and then the cooked vegetables and you don't let them even see the other food and you give them real small portions that is not too scary or overwhelming. And you start with that and then you get the, the food that's more savory and, and uh, potentially saltier and that sort of thing later on in the meal uh, uh, because otherwise they wouldn't be touched. They wouldn't be touched. Uh, otherwise, then you get all mad at them. Hey, you're going to eat your this or that. And then when you force food on kids like that, you can create aversions. You can create something where they get disgusted by the idea of baked broccoli or something like that. And that's no good. That's no good for everybody. Remember that food takes several tastes. It takes about 15 exposures in order to have a uh, learned flavor preference. Uh, just like it takes about 15 times to hear a song before you really have memorized it. And it's sort of like muscle memory in your brain, I guess you could say, you know, rote memorization. Uh, and so that's when we become familiar with a flavor, when we've tasted it about 15 times, and we can anticipate the flavor and not be scared and not have a disgust response. Uh, so with kids, it's trying to expose them to a little, um, a small amounts of not too scary portion sizes of uh, various flavors like broccoli and carrots and things like that, uh, so that they start to uh, learn the flavor and not be scared of it. Okay, let's see here. Did we get any other questions? Oh, we did. Is miso okay as a salt replacement in recipes? I've heard that this is a, uh, a reasonable replacement. It depends on how much sodium is in miso. And I think that there is low in sodium is from my first, um, from what I'm remembering. I, I know that I think I've heard of miso being used in some of Chef AJ's recipes and, and that kind of thing. So let's see. Miso nutrition facts. I think it depends on the miso that you get. So uh, in just a brief, brief search, it looks like miso could contain, if you get miso by itself, uh, it's a fermented soybean, uh, but it has salt. So it depends. You'd want to get a low salt version. So I guess the answer is it depends, Garen. Trying to get a low salt version. Okay. 
Mm, why does salt burn my tongue? Well, I know what it does to worms and stuff. As a kid, you know, people would put wor you know, salt on worms and they would get all messed up. I know that it, 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 um, it can disrupt membranes. It can dis disrupt membranes and uh, because of the osmotic gradient, um, water will try to go where salt is. And uh, it's when you have something really salty, like direct salt on your tongue, uh, it could disrupt. It can be disruptive, or uh, it can even has and even has just a straight up mechanical. Uh, you know, it's a salty, pointy crystal, so uh, uh, it can. You know, when you salt on the tongue, but yeah, if you have any any open wounds, you pull salt on the wound. They talk about it. You can. It's it's disrupting to the membranes of the cell, and uh, can cause local destruction. So maybe if there's any tiny cuts on the tongue and you eat something really super salty, then you could actually feel it. So let's go from there. Let's go from there. It was it was a great time meeting with you guys. Thank you so much for all of your questions. And until next week, I will I will see you next week at 12 o'clock noon, 12 noon, <laughs> uh, 12 sharp. And uh, until next week, stay vegan. See you then.